Hello friends, how are you doing? Happy Monday. I hope that you are all doing well. It is finals week for me, so I'm trying not to gouge my eyes out. <laughs> yeah, I've been taking four classes during the summer and that's a lot. And yes, I am crazy. Do not do that. And then I get a week break to which I am going on a mini vacation and then it's right back into the fall semester to which I am taking five classes. So please pray for me if that's your thing. <laughs> I would greatly appreciate it and I greatly need them. Other than that, um, while I am on vacation, do not worry, you will have an episode coming out normal time on Monday. So while I'm out relaxing, you guys can also be relaxing and listen to the podcast. So there's always that. Other than that, this week I took the motorcycle out for a couple of rides, which is always fun. I currently have my permit, but I will be getting my license soon. I have to take the driving portion and then I'll have it. I've just been taking rides around my residential neighborhood, trying to get more comfortable, that kind of thing. And for me, it's a big de-stressor, you know, so self-care is very important, you guys. Take care of yourselves, take care of your health, including your mental health. Find hobbies and things that you enjoy doing and, and do them. Give yourself some self-love. Other than that, I hope you guys have had a wonderful week and I hope you're ready to dive in. Now, I usually start these episodes with some sort of question or reflection and that's not going to change for this one. I want you to sit and think about the social situations you have been in before. Now, they don't even have to be like an emergency type or response type of thing. But even just simply think about when you're in high school and the teachers present some type of subject and they ask if anyone has any questions. And maybe you had a question, but you didn't want to raise your hand. Or what about for like my military friends? Have you been in a group with your coworkers and then all of a sudden your sergeant comes up and asks for volunteers and then it's just an awkward silence and no one wants to volunteer to do whatever they're going to ask? <laughs> Just remember your response. Or maybe you have been in like an emergency type of situation. Maybe you once saw a car crash on the side of the road and instead of stopping and pulling over or asking for help, you drove by even though no one else has responded yet. Just think, because today we're going to go over the bystander effect. So, the bystander effect, or bystander apathy, is a social psychological theory that states that an individual's likelihood of helping decreases when passive bystanders are present in an emergency situation. It has also been found that observers are more likely to take action if there are few or no other witnesses present. Say what? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. So I want to go over a case here. And it is the most frequently cited example of the bystander effect in introductory psychology textbooks. And it's about the brutal murder of a young woman. On the morning of March 13th, 1964, 28-year-old woman Catherine, or known as Kitty Genovese, returned to her apartment complex at 3 a.m., after finishing her shift at a local bar in Queens, New York. After parking her car in a lot adjacent to her apartment building, she began walking the short distance to the entrance, which was located at the back of the building. As she walked, she noticed a figure at the far end of the lot. She shifted directions and headed towards a different street, but the man followed her and he seized her. She was attacked and stabbed by a man later identified as Winston Mosley. This attack began at 3.20 a.m. Her screams and cries for help riveted across the neighborhood. Lights went on around the courtyard so they knew that people could hear her and potentially could see what was happening. Someone on the seventh floor even opened their window and shouted out, What's going on down there? Let that girl alone! When the attacker heard the neighbor, he walked back to his car. Kitty was somehow still alive and managed to get up, and she staggeredly walked towards her building entrance, while still crying for help. 
She ended up collapsing in the hallway. The perpetrator returned and he stabbed Katie Genovese again and again and again, up to eight times. Once again, the lights came on and the windows opened, driving the assaulter away from the scene. Unfortunately, the assailant returned and stabbed Kitty for the final time once those lights went off again. The first call to the police came in at 3.50 a.m. and the police arrived in two minutes. Despite Kitty's repeated calls for help, none of the dozen or so people in the nearby apartment building who heard her cries called the police to report the incident. When the neighbors were asked why they did not intervene or call the police earlier, some answers were, I didn't want to get involved. Frankly, we were afraid. Or, I was just tired. I went back to bed. Now remember, guys, she was attacked at 3.20. First call to police was at 3.50. So there were 30 minutes of time when this attack was happening and no one called the police. So after the initial report, the case was launched into nationwide attention with various leaders commenting on the apparent moral decay of the country. Well, isn't that something they always say after something horrendous like this happens? <laughs> An initial article in the New York Times sensationalized the case and it reported a number of factual inaccuracies, which we'll go over. An article in the September 2007 issue of American Psychologist concluded that the story is largely misrepresented mostly due to the accuracies repeatedly published and also in psychology textbooks. Researchers have found that onlookers are less likely to intervene if the situation is ambiguous. In the case of Kitty Genovese, it was reported that 38 witnesses were there and that also that they thought that they were just witnessing a lover's quarrel and they didn't realize that she was being murdered. Now, while her case has been the subject to numerous misrepresentations and inaccuracies, there have been many other cases reported that do fall into this bystander effect mentality. And we know that this can clearly have a powerful impact on social behavior, but why exactly does it happen? And why don't we help when we are part of a crowd? Now, the inaccuracies that have been reported throughout the years, the first one is that in actuality, only a few people physically saw Kitty Genovese and her attacker, and the others, they just heard screams. So no one actually witnessed the stabbing taking place. The original article that was published in the New York Times, it did state that the murder took place on Austin Street in New York City in full view, but it took place in a stairway in the entrance of the apartment building. So that's the Kitty Genovese case. But now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about another case. And it is most commonly known as the Lulu Lemon murder. Have you heard of it? So, on March 11th, 2011, at a Lulu Lemon Athletica store located in Bethesda, Maryland, a murder took place. So what happened was, Brittany Norwood, a store worker, and Jaina Murray, a fellow employee at the store, they were working the night shift and they were closing up shop. Well, after they closed up shop, Brittany Norwood called Jaina Murray and said, Hey, I left my wallet in the store. Can you please let me back in? Because uh, I think Br I think Jaina had the keys or something. So she said, yeah, I'll let you back in. They get back in to the store. And as Brittany and Jaina were walking toward the back of the store, Brittany attacked Jaina. She inflicted over 300 injuries, including head trauma and stab wounds. Jaina died in the store's back hallway, after which Brittany staged a crime scene and claimed that intruders had raped both women and killed Jaina. Brittany pretty much was playing the victim. She even inflicted wounds on herself to make it look like she was attacked as well. But later when she was medically evaluated, even the doctors were like, yeah, her wounds are superficial. And like, why does Jaina have so many more wounds and more of a vicious attack against her? So it was a little bit suspicious, so to say. So the prosecution, they were barred from introducing certain evidence into this case, which honestly I kind of think is unfair. 
because it was motive for the murder. So there was evidence that Jaina had accused Brittany of shoplifting. She was either stealing money from the store or merchandise from the store. And this wasn't her first time doing that. There are other past employments where she was caught doing that. And so the speculation was that Jaina was going to report her to the manager the next day. So this case received intense media coverage and there were many reasons for that. So there were a lot of bizarre lies that Brittany told the police. I mean, at first she staged a crime scene. She made it look like she was attacked as well. She gave false descriptions of their attack, quote unquote attackers when really she was the one who attacked Jaina. A few other lies that she told the police, for example, and they caught her in her lies, was I guess after the attack and brutal murder of Jaina, Brittany went and took Jaina's car and moved it, I guess, to make it look like she wasn't there so that people wouldn't be suspicious. And this was after the attack. So she had Jaina's blood all over her. And so the police, they found Jaina's blood in her own car. And they're like, well, this doesn't really add up. But they also found Brittany's DNA in the vehicle as well. And when they discovered that, they called Brittany back in for questioning. And they asked her one simple question. Have you ever been inside of Jaina's vehicle? She wasn't that smart, guys. She told the police, no, I've never been in her vehicle. Like, <laughs> and they found her DNA in the vehicle because she drove it. And it was on the driver's side. It's not like it was on the passenger side or, or anything like that. Now, it will also be remembered for, of course, the 331 wounds that were inflicted onto Jaina as well. And also, it only took the jury a single hour to reach a guilty verdict against Brittany, which is well-deserved. Now, we're going to get into the bystander effect of this case. So, there was an Apple store right next to the Lululemon store. And I guess there were a few employees there. You know, the store was closed, but they were, they were there late at night. And I guess they had some Apple release coming the next day, so they were prepping and that kind of thing. Two of the employees at the Apple store, they heard cries for help and did nothing. During the trial, the jury actually, they watched a surveillance video from the Apple store where two employees, they stood right next to the wall, which was adjoining the Lululemon store and listened. Now in court, Janice Sturzo, that was one of the two employees, quoted the words that she heard that night. She said that one voice said, talk to me, don't do this. And then later, another one said, God help me, please help me. So the video shows after them listening that they eventually were returning to work. Now, the other employee, Ricardo Rios, he told a detective that he thought the noise was just drama and not violence. The store's security guard didn't hear anything either. I guess he was listening to his iPod and no one called the police. We're going to later talk about why the bystander effect occurs and different reasons and those. Yeah, we're going to get into that. But here is my problem with this. I think that they heard a lot more than what they are claiming to hear because they're saying the first voice was, you know, talk to me, don't do this. So it kind of sounds like Jaina was pleading for her life. Like she knew that Brittany was obviously holding a knife and was threatening her. And then the next they heard, God help me, please help me. I've never been stabbed with a knife before, but I am going to assume that it is very painful. <laughs> not, not only did Jaina get stabbed once, she got stabbed 330 times. And I'm pretty sure she cried out and screamed out in pain. And how could you not hear that? How could you just ignore that? Now, I get if one employee had earbuds in, but, you know, the other one that could hear and not do anything about it or not call for help, it seems kind of suspicious. But that's just my take on it. You have to form your own opinion about it. Now, with technology, I mean, <laughs> technology is great. It has its advantages, but also its disadvantages. And we have come across the problem of having digital bystanders. And so I'm going to use a modern day example. Now, you remember back in t April of 2017, it was a uh, United Airlines flight and they were overbooked. And so they just decided to randomly select people to be removed from the flight. Well, one man, he was, I believe, a doctor on his way to treating somebody. <laughs> 
and he was selected and he refused to get up. And in response, three security officers came on board the plane and physically removed the man out of his seat. And in the process, they slapped his face against an armrest. Now, as this event transpired, the other passengers on the plane were just sitting there in silence. Emphasis on sitting. (laughs) No one got up to help the man. You could hear one lady screaming, what are you doing? But besides that, the passenger's immediate response to the situation, like many others in our society would be, was to not intervene, but to record. Why does this happen? Why do we not intervene? And because of the Kitty Genovese case, there was a series of experiments that began in the 1960s and 1970s to try to gain understanding of the bystander effect. So Bib Latine and John Darley, they wanted to test out the bystander effect by engineering an emergency situation and measuring how long it took for participants to get help. So one of the first experiments, they were college students. They were ushered into a solitary room under the impression that a conversation centered around learning in a high stress, high urban environment would ensue. So this discussion occurred with other participants, in quotations, that were in their own room as well. So the other participants were just actual records playing. So each participant would speak one at a time into a microphone. After a round of discussion, one of the participants would have a seizure, in quotients, in the middle of the discussion. So the amount of time that it took the college student to obtain help from the research assistant that was outside of the room was measured. If the student did not get help after six minutes, the experiment was cut off. So Darley and Latine, they believed that the more people there were in the discussion, the longer it would take subjects to get help. So the results were actually in line with this hypothesis. The smaller the group, the more likely the victim was to receive timely help. Still, those who did not get help, they showed signs of nervousness and concern for the victim. The researchers, they believed that the signs of nervousness highlight that the college student participants were most likely still deciding the best course of action to take, which does contrast with the leaders of the time who believed inaction was due to indifference. So that was one finding that came from the study. So there was another experiment that also involved college students. Subjects were placed in one of three treatment conditions, alone in a room with two other participants or with three confederates who pretended to be normal participants. As the participants sat filling out questionnaires, smoke began to fill the room. Don't worry, y'all, it was actually steam. Note, nobody was harmed during the making of this experiment. When participants were alone, 75% reported the smoke to the experimenters. In contrast, just 38% of participants in a room with two other people reported the smoke. And in the final group, two confederates in the experiment noted the smoke and then ignored it, which resulted in only 10% of the participants reporting the smoke. Within two minutes, 50% had taken action and 75% had acted within six minutes when the experiment ended. In groups of three participants, 62% carried on working for the entire duration of the experiment. In interviews afterwards, participants, they reported feeling hesitant about showing anxiety, so they looked to others for signs of anxiety. But since everyone was trying to appear calm, these signs were not evident and therefore they believed that they must have misinterpreted the situation and redefined it as being safe. So this is a clear example of pluralistic ignorance, which is one of the things that we will cover later on. There are also additional experiments that found that 70% of people would help a woman in distress when they were the only witness, but only about 40% offered assistance when other people were present. Now, before we move on to the next experiment, I want you guys to think back to when we did the Milgram's experiment episode. Now, remember, we went over the autonomous state and the agentic state. I hope you remember what those are. 
But if you didn't, I will be kind and remind you. The autonomous state was when people direct their own actions and they take responsibility for the results of those. And then the agentic state was when people allow others to direct their actions and then pass off the responsibility for the consequences to the person giving orders. Or I think even in the bystander effect case, this could be the person that they see as being the leader or just the other person. So I just want us to reflect on that and see if there's potential that those two states of behavior could be a possibility of why people intervene and why they don't. So in 1976, Shotland and Straw did their own experiment. So they hypothesized that people would be less willing to intervene in a situation of domestic violence than in a situation involving violence involving two strangers. Male participants were shown a staged fight between a man and a woman. In one condition, the woman screamed, I don't even know you, while in other, she screamed, I don't even know why I married you. Three times as many men intervened in the first condition as in the second condition. Such findings support that people are less likely to intervene if they believe that the incident does not require their personal responsibility. Kind of sounds like the agenic state, doesn't it? But this also... But this also gets, but this also gets into the explanations of the bystander effect. So there are two major factors that do contribute to the bystander effect. So now, first, the presence of other people creates a diffusion of responsibility. So because there are other observers, individuals do not feel as much pressure to take action. But this could also mean that the agenic state is at play and they are diffusing that responsibility onto someone else. Now, there is also that the moral obligation to help does not fall only on one person, but the entire group. This makes it to where one person can blame the entire group for the responsibility of actions versus just their selves. It's easier to say that you are not responsible if you are part of a group because then you can place blame on the entire group or on other people in the group, if that makes sense, versus you yourself are the only person present and the only person to blame. So bystanders are less likely to intervene in emergency situations as the size of the group increases because then they feel less personal responsibility. Huh, kind of sounds like the Milgram experiment a little bit, doesn't it? Yabba dabba do. I hope my explanations make sense to you. Y'all, I should be a rapper. What do you think? Yeah? No? Okay, anyways. No, the second reason is the need to behave in correct and socially acceptable ways. This is called evaluation apprehension. So when other observers fail to react, individuals often take this as a sign that a response is not needed or not appropriate. There is also that social fear that if we take action, then that will be judged by others, especially of those in the group. And well, they might also feel like if they step in and help, that then they will be superseded by someone else in the group. Now, the last reason that could explain this is pluralistic ignorance. So a crisis is often chaotic and the situation is not always crystal clear. So onlookers might wonder what exactly is happening. During such moments, people often look to others in the group to determine what's appropriate. So people in a group will look at other people in the group to see what their reactions are. And if no one in the group is taking any action, then we tend to evaluate the circumstance and think that, well, maybe no action is required. So I kind of gave an example of this at the beginning when I said, you know, do you ever remember sitting in high school and the teacher asks you to raise your hand and you have a question, but you don't want to raise your hand? This example is also cited by Deborah A. Prentice. And she claims that this is often due to the belief that everyone else understands the material. So for the fear of looking inadequate, no one will ask clarifying questions. It's this type of thinking that explains the effect because the overarching idea is uncertainty and perception. So what separates this is the ambiguousness that can define a situation. So if the situation is clear and understood, then pluralistic ignorance would not apply since everyone would know what everyone is thinking. There is an 11-step process of thinking that explains this. Step 1. 
Bystander A is in a specific place and nothing has happened. Step number two. A situation occurs that is ambiguous in nature, so it is not certain what has occurred or what the ramifications of the event are, and bystander A notices it. What is going on here? Step number three. Bystander A believes that this is an emergency situation, but is unaware of how the rest of the bystanders perceive the situation. Step number four, a course of action is taken. This could be a few things like charging into the situation or calling the police, but in pluralistic ignorance, bystander A chooses to understand more about the situation by looking around and taking in the reaction of others. Step number five. As observation takes place, bystander A is not aware that the other bystanders may be doing the same thing. Thus, when surveying others' reactions, bystander A misperceives the other bystander's observation of the situation as purposeful in action. Step number six. As bystander A notes the reaction of the others, bystander A puts the reaction of the other bystanders in context. Step number seven. Bystander A then believes that the inaction of others is due to their belief that an emergency situation is not occurring. Step number eight. Thus, bystander A believes that there is an accident, but also believes that others do not perceive the situation as an emergency. Bystander A then changes their initial belief. Step number nine. Bystander A now believes that there is no emergency. Step number 10. Bystander A has another opportunity to help. Step number 11. Bystander A chooses not to help because of the belief that there is not an emergency. So this operates under the assumption that all the other bystanders are also going through these 11 steps. Thus, they all choose to not help due to the mis- perception of others' reactions to the same situation. Now, there are other explanations, but those three are the most widely known and accepted. There are other theories like the confusion of responsibility. So that occurs when a bystander fears that helping could lead to others to believing that they are the perpetrator. And this fear can cause people to not act in dire situations. Another example is priming, and this occurs when a person is given cues that will influence future actions. So for example, if a person is given a list of words that are associated with home decoration and furniture, and then are asked to give a five-letter word, answers like chair or table would be more likely than pasta. Okay, that sounds kind of weird, but in social situations... It has been found that simply thinking of being in a group would lead to lower rates of helping in emergency situations. This occurs because groups are often associated with being lost in a crowd, being de-individuated, and having a lowered sense of personal accountability. Thus, authors argue that the way a person was primed could also influence their ability to help. These alternate theories highlight the fact that the bystander effect is a complex phenomenon that encompasses a variety of ideologies. We could look at those other cases that were explained earlier and maybe try to come up with one of these reasons of why they didn't respond. You know, some even claimed, well, it's not my responsibility. Some claimed, oh, I didn't know what was going on. Some claimed that they didn't fully understand that the situation was a emergency. So how do we overcome the bystander effect? I mean, if you were put in a situation where you were being attacked or you were in a car wreck or something, you would expect someone to help, right? So some psychologists, they suggest that simply being aware that the bystander effect exists, it's perhaps the greatest way to break the cycle. When you're faced with a situation that requires action, 
understand how the bystander effect might be holding you back and consciously take steps to overcome it. However, this does not mean you should place yourself in danger by any means. You know, what if you're the person in need of assistance? Like, how can you inspire people to lend you a hand? One often recommended tactic is to single out one person from the crowd to make eye contact and ask that individual specifically for help. By personalizing and individualizing your request, it becomes much harder for people to turn you down. So a good example of doing this came up and I posted the New York Times news article that was in regards to the Kitty Genovese murder case. And it was pretty much a hint to what this whole episode would be about. And a good friend of mine that I went to school with, Winter, I'm going to give you a quick shout out here. She responded, you know, by standard apathy, question mark. And I was like, yes, you know, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. And then her response was, I have learned that when appointing people during an emergency, you don't say someone call 911. You say, hey, you in the red shirt, call 911, which is a perfect example of of doing this, of what they suggest in preventing the bystander effect. So that was really cool to have that response and having that technique and that actually being something that psychologists have <laughs> suggested people to do. So, Latine and Darley, in 1970, they formulated a five-stage model calling the decision model of helping to explain why bystanders at emergencies sometimes do and sometimes don't offer help. So, at each stage in the model, the answer no results in no help being given, while the answer yes leads to the individual closer to offering help. So, however, they did argue that hoping responses may be inhibited at any stage of the process. For example, the bystander may not notice the situation or the situation may be ambiguous and not readily interpreted as an emergency. So, with this model, first, bystander must notice that something is amiss. Two, the bystander must define that situation as an emergency. Three, the bystander must assess how personally responsible they feel. Step four, the bystander must decide how best to offer assistance. And step five, the bystander must act on that decision. But, you know, there are limitations to the decision helping model. Others believe that the decision helping model provides a valuable framework for understanding bystander intervention. Although primarily it's developed to explain emergency situations, it hasn't been applied to other situations such as preventing someone from deciding to donate a kidney to a relative, you know, something like that. Now, the decision model does not provide a complete picture either. It fails to explain why no decisions are made at each stage of the decision tree. This is particularly true after people have originally interpreted the event as an emergency, and it also doesn't take account the emotional factors such as anxiety or fear nor does it focus on why people do help, and it mainly concentrates on why people do not help. There was another article or study published in 1969 and 1981 by Piliavin and other authors, and they put forward the cost-reward arousal model as a major alternative to the decision model, and it involves evaluating the consequences of helping or not helping. So it's more of like whether one helps or not depends on the outcome of weighing both the costs and the rewards of helping. So the costs of helping include effort, time, loss of resources, risk of harm, and negative emotional response. But the rewards of helping include fame, gratitude from the victim and relatives, and self-satisfaction derived from the act of helping others. It is recognized that costs may be different for different people and they may even differ from one occasion to another for the same person. So also the negative account of the consequences of the bystander effect, it also undermines the potential positives. So the article Be Aware to Care Public Self-Awareness leads to a reversal of the bystander effect. It details how crowds can actually increase the amount of aid given to a victim under certain circumstances. One of the problems with bystanders in emergency situations is the ability to split the responsibility, you know, the diffusion of responsibility that we talked about. However, when they are accountability cues, 
people they tend to help more. So this is specific markers that let the bystander know that their actions are being watched or highlighted, like a camera, for instance. In a series of experiments, the researchers tested if the bystander effect can be reversed using these cues, which seems pretty cool. And this actually reminds me of a video that I saw on YouTube, and it's actually based on leadership, but it's called First Follower Leadership Lessons from Dancing Guy. And the whole premise of the video, it's at some type of music festival, and there's just this one guy dancing like crazy. And everyone's just kind of looking at him like, what are you doing? You know, whatever, live your life. And then a second guy, jumps in and starts dancing along with him. And before you know it, another person joins in and another person joins in. And by the end of the video, it's like everyone has joined in to dancing. And so the point of the video is the first follower has more impact with starting a movement or leadership than the first leader. And when you watch the video, you can think of the social aspects that come into play when that first follower joins in. And then another person starts to realize, oh, okay, it's okay. And then before you know it, everyone is dancing. So going back to <laughs> accountability cues, an online forum that was centered around aiding those with severe emotional distress was created. The participants in the study responded to specific messages from visitors of the forum and then rate how visible they felt on the forum. The researchers postulated that when there were no accountability cues, people would not give as much help and would not rate themselves as being very visible on the forum. But when there are accountability cues, so like if there was a webcam being used and it highlighted the name of the forum visitor, not only would more people help, but they would also rate themselves as having a higher presence on the forum. So as expected, the results fell in line with these theories. Targeting one's reputation through accountability cues could increase the likelihood of helping. This shows that there are potential positives to the bystander effect. You guys know on this show that I love talking about the brain. <laughs> I find it so interesting. And so there is actually neuroimaging evidence. And what is so crazy is I don't think in my psychology class we covered this part. We might have, but I just don't remember it. But researchers have looked at the regions of the brain that were active when a participant witnessed emergencies. And they noticed that less activity occurred in the regions that facilitate helping. For instance, this is in the pre and post central gyrus and the medial prefrontal cortex. So one's initial biological response to an emergency situation is an action due to personal fear. So it's that limbic system responding to that fear response, which we've kind of talked about already. After that initial fear though, Sympathy arises, which prompts someone to go to the aid of the victim. So these two symptoms, they work in opposition. Whichever one arrives, the one determines the action that will be taken. <laughs> if there is more sympathy than personal distress, the participant will help. Thus, these researchers argued that the decision to help is not really reflective, but reflexive. And with this in mind, the researchers argue for a more personalized view, which does take into account one's personality and disposition to be more sympathetic rather than utilize a one-size-fits-all overall generalization of everybody. <laughs> so, but that is something important to think about because we do initially get that response it, it may say fear response, but it's fight or flight or, you know, it's your body physiologically responding to what they see happen or what they presume to see happening. And so maybe just taking in notice that your body does respond in that biological way. And I think knowing that is powerful. It's kind of like knowing about the bystander effect is powerful. Also knowing how your body reacts to certain responses is also important. So what do you think of the bystander effect? Are you going to think twice about next time you're in a certain social situation? I think I will. Let me know what you think. Well, that's a wrap, you guys. I hope you got something from this episode. I hope you learned something new. I hope you thoroughly enjoyed it. I enjoyed making it. Now, before I 
sign off. I do want to let you guys know that there is a Facebook page for the podcast. And I also created a Facebook group so that listeners of the podcast can interact. So let me know if you want to join the group. Let me know if you have any questions or any suggestions. I am your host, Katie Gonzalez, and you've been listening to What the Psychology. Stay psyched, y'all.